Okay, uh, so tonight we have one final message from, uh, one final message tonight from Pastor Stevens on continuing to change. Uh, so you listen to that tonight, watch that. 30 t- Sorry, no, uh, no song leading from Pastor Sturge this week. Sorry about that. And I, I looked for other things, but again, so he was very blessed, annoyed a little bit that we did that, but <laughs> no, he was happy to have it. Uh, but tonight is continuing to change, continue to change. It's another uh, message from uh, 1994, I believe, is when it was preached. Um, let's see, uh, one thing to remind you about, uh, there's a sign-up sheet for a trip next weekend to Culpeper. If you want to go and minister in Culpeper, uh, with uh, Becca's dad is down there pastoring. So, uh, it'd be great to have a bunch of people go to Culpeper, Virginia. It's, you know, uh, that'll be, that will be next weekend, 16th, 16th and the 17th there. All right. And, uh, anything else? Uh, you know, I'll, you can turn in your papers as you need to. If you, if you, if, if if no one's at the office, if someone's at the office, you can give it to them, and they can put them, put the papers in my mailbox there. Um, otherwise, if you have anything, you can email me uh, anything that you might be missing, and I'll be looking over everything over the weekend. And uh, if I see something that you know, yes. There's going to be one question from this message on the final. Yep, it'll be the last question. So be asked to give a few sentences about this last lesson. It'll carry a weight on the, on the final. So, yes, you do have to pay attention tonight. You cannot blow this message off. Like, you know, so I did include something about this message on the final. So, all right, anything else? All right, you're all good? Okay. All right. So, Jesus, we thank you for bringing us together tonight. We thank you for a great season of listening to and hearing from Pastor Stevens and Pastor Schaller and others this, week, this, uh, this semester. We ask you to give us your focus, your concentration tonight. Uh, we thank you for the timelessness of these messages. Uh, we just pray for this season of the year and uh, for people we minister to and invite. And just thank you, Lord. Bless our families. All these things we commit to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's watch Pastor. We have had a lot of requests about this morning's message in the class. I would suggest that even though we usually do not sell those messages, probably. Okay, we will. We will let the message go. But here's the thing. At a price. At a very dear price. Now, you, would, you usually pay $75, $80, or $45 for half-hour counseling to your counselors across this city. That message was said to have six counseling sessions. That would be $300. You, you can buy it on payment, the payment plan. Now, we'll, we will have the message ready if your visitors were only teasing. The message will be ready, but you have to sign up for it with Pastor Capello. The message has to do with your wonderful emotions. And your fa- do you know that six kids from the high school was, were deeply touched this morning? I found out six. Just heard of, the, of another one. And I'm so pleased about that. Their first class, and, and several of them, several have acknowledged they were transformed more in this morning's class than any time in years. Message I just got. That's why it's so crucial that they get under a college classroom here. All right? Now let's see. What else is it? That's all. All right, would you go back to First Timothy again, chapter one, please? Okay, although I was a former blas, formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an 
insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And notice verse 14, and the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with what? With faith and what? Love, which are in Christ Jesus. And this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. All right. Now I'm ready for this message. I am not going to keep you long. As long as I want to, but not long. Now, we have been having a series on mercy. That's the first thing we obtain when we get saved, mercy. Sins are gone, sin is gone. Then grace, God adds to us righteousness, positional truth, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Louis Berry Schaefer said, what, 35 things at sal salvation in his book on the theology? All right. But picture a Christian having mercy and grace and not being changed. Uh, can I uh, be honest with, with anybody that the Holy Spirit would care to convict? Never accept condemnation unless... Never accept that anyway, but, but do accept conviction for change. Here's the principle. The problem that some folks have in every church, they are in all walks of life, is they never live in a position of being changed all the time. The problem that some Christians have in every single church. Pastor Brooks, so good to see you tonight. I'm sorry I missed you. When your son was up here, I'd had you come up too. I'd see if I had witnessed you being here. All right. Had to get that in. I love him so much, i got to get it in. Now, picture this tonight. You come to a class, you come to church. And you don't live in a position of change. See? You like it? You love mercy. That's why you're here. You love grace. You understand that mercy has taken care of everything, and grace adds to you everything God is. Mercy took away your sinful account, and grace gave you Jesus, gave you Jesus Christ's righteousness. So you love it. Now, but you don't understand the principle with faith and love in the Lord Jesus Christ to function in change. A fellow called me up many years ago in one of my first trials, and I've had so many, I can't remember how many I've had. And he said, you're really going through it. He was a pastor. He said, you're really going through it, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am said, are you dead yet? I said, I'm sure dying. He said, well, I'm dead. I hope you join the fraternity of the free. <laughs> That's funny. You're supposed to laugh. at. That's deep. <laughs> then he said, I have never seen a preacher yet that could have a resurrection that hadn't had death come beforehand. He said, it's pretty difficult to be resurrected when you haven't died yet. So that's why I asked you, have you died yet? And you know that's true. God puts on the pressure so that you get weaker and weaker and weaker until you die. Just before you die, you want to die physically. <laughs> oh, my land, you climb for the... Lifeboat, you climb for anything that's out there. Oh, I'm terrible. And you confess your weakness. You confess your misery. You confess how much Christianity doesn't work. But you're not dead yet. So with all that you know, you have not had a resurrection. One tremendous thing is the privilege of living in a position to change. Now, I have lost, before I lost weight, I lost 450 pounds in four and a half years. 
You say, I did not know that you have a weight. I didn't, but um, I would go on a program and lose it, gain it back. 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 That's what I mean by 450 pounds. I mean, I lost a little weight, 30 pounds, gain it back. It used to be so much fun to get on the scales and go from 195 to 193. 191, 189, 185, 184, 185. You're away in Tacoma, 188. Back to 185. Back to 183, 181, 179. I'm dramatizing this because I want some people in this body to go on a diet. 179, 181. You know how it goes some days. Lots of, a lot of it is water, but nevertheless. Then finally, you really make headway, 175, 173, 171. All of a sudden, you fast three days and three nights, and you don't do it because of weight, but you get up in 167. 166, 165, 162. Then you're putting on clothes that you would have given away, but you wanted the challenge of getting back to being a 32 and a half waistline. Oh, the change. After I got down to my desired weight, 160, this is what I said. I said, I'm going to put it back on again so I can enjoy the changing. <laughs> Oh, the change is wonderful, Ron. You ought to try it sometime. I mean, <laughs> now. <laughs> so, changing is a very beautiful thing. Now, this is what happens in a person's life. God says, wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, and we all, with an unveiled face, as in a mirror, the word of God, behold the glory of the Lord, that is the nature of God and his character and characteristics, and are changed, are changed from glory to glory, and the original says, just as the Spirit of the Lord does it. I quoted to you the original. Now, we have a beautiful wonderful, present, passive, indicative. We receive the action of always being changed. Then we have a progressive, present, linear action start, continually changed. I wish I could get that across to you tonight. Knowing mercy and knowing grace does not change me. That's why we read this evening, 1 Timothy 1.14. We must understand that the righteousness of faith is what we speak of, and do not say, or do not try to bring Christ down from heaven, or go into hell and bring him up from, the, from hell. Because we preach the righteousness which is of faith, even the word of faith which is in your mouth and in your heart. The word of faith that is in your mouth and in your heart. And if we confess the Lord Jesus with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be changed. That's as Christians. Now, here's a marriage over here. And the Here Our Marriage series is summer. And they're right here. And they do not allow the message to take them into a position of change. There was enough in the rap session 
Sunday night to transform people. Sunday night. There was enough said in the rapture to change a person for the week in the rap alone. Now, here's a position of change. I hear a message like this morning, and six beautiful, precious high school kids were changed. Three of them wept. Three seniors wept. Six reported tremendous conviction of change. And that's what the Word of God is, the Word of faith is all about. But it says, and the love which is in Christ Jesus. Now, the Holy Spirit sheds the love abroad in our hearts, and that's an iterative, perfect, passive, indicative. Now, this is what that means. Iterative means perfect, an action that occurred in the past which keeps reoccurring in the process of life. The passive voice is the Holy Spirit gives you the love. The indicative mood is it's declarative and dogmatic and dynamic and a reality. So the love of God shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit then is what? It is dogmatic dynamic and you receive it that means that the love of Christ compels me or constrains me and I thus judge if one died we're all dead that we should henceforth not live unto ourselves but unto God that raised Jesus from the dead now that love of Christ constrains us is a progressive present active indicative that means and I'm giving you the tenses it means continually so, we have mercy, and hallelujah, Paul obtained mercy in verse 13 of 1 Timothy 1. Mercy met with truth, and righteousness and peace kissed each other, and truth came up and sprung up from the earth, and righteousness looked down from heaven. And the Word of God says, righteousness goes before you, and God arranges that we may go in His steps. Now, we have all the way of His steps in verse 13 of Psalm 85. Now we have... Every, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Every pastor, you hear this. Every single pastor, you hear this. Every pastor's wife, you hear this. Do you want divine, primitive, preventive suffering in the future? Do you want divine, preventive suffering for the future? Then listen to this message. Don't you wait for your husband to be changed. And don't you wait for that wife of yours to be changed. I, I know of women in this body that would be waiting until the rapture. <laughs> and I know of men, you might, you might have to wait until the rapture. Now, God wants us to go through metamorpho, an inward change, not meta change schematizo or outward change. He wants the inward change. Now, either every single day of my life I live being changed all the time. That's why I gave you the tenses tonight. And every single Christian must be change. For example, if I leave the, the uh, service tonight, went home and watched something on stu stupid TV, I'm being changed, but I'm not being changed by the Spirit. Now, in the right kind of change, we are changed from a position to position in Christ. And it's a very beautiful thing. Now, we are always going to change. Unitarians and liberals that used to believe something have changed. Watch how we change. We don't go from A to Z. Just like this. I'm changing backwards. We meddle with change. We associate with people that change. We're with our relatives more than we used to be that, that that are 
are never changing in the plan of God. They're not never changing to be like Christ. We're not aware of it. It's it's slow. Not anything serious yet. That's how the school could go over here, the high school, in the case of Tell. If if that isn't governed from my office, that's how it will go. Go home to family. Unsaved family members. Changing. We go from change to change. 1981 to 1985, that's what a lot of people did. Now, this is very serious. I want you to see Roy Rogers and I <laughs> change. People go home in the summer to another country and they do things they shouldn't do sometimes. They enter into meddling with change. That's what Michael was sharing about this country, 1947, from 1803 to 1962, 1963, 1975. Change. 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 That's why I don't want the quality of our gospel music to change. That's why I don't want Christians that participate in the music, hear me now, I want them to pray alone. I want them to pray with their family or their wife. If you don't pray with your wife every day, you've already ended into change. You, it's not, oh, honey, this, dear God, bless this day, help everybody, bless everyone, bless pastor, bless her, bless my wife, amen. That's not prayer. That's appeasing your guilt. You're always changing. I want the same thing to build this church that built my, the other six churches that I was a pastor of. What some of, some of you can't help, and this, don't, please don't be condemned. I'm just, I'm just addressing an issue. Some of you haven't been, a rap, haven't been to a rap since the convention. That's okay, except... The raps are called body life. This is the fullness of preaching and the fullness of the body here. The raps are the fullness of the body that comes from the fullness of preaching. Now, some can't because of your work schedule. And I'm not saying you can. You have to work severe hours. I understand that. This is not committed to you. You do very well to be when you can. Others could come. But it's their heart. They made up their mind. They don't need the word all the time. They don't need fellowship all the time. Every staff member should come to hear a class once a week at least. Every single employee should hear the message once a week. I'll guarantee you if you don't. You don't know it, but you've already entered into change. Now... I was counseling somebody the other day, and I said, this, after listening to them, I said, the Bible says that no harm can come upon you if you follow that which is good, 1 Peter 3.13. That which is good is mercy, grace, faith that comes from categories, and the motivating force that makes it all work, love. See, mercy and grace without faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. 
Without love, it's possible to know God. So without faith, you cannot please God. And without love, you cannot know God. And you cannot serve him. The Bible says we should have a faith that serves by love in Galatians 5, 6, where there is no circumcision or uncircumcision. So this is what happens. Here's what happens to some people in this ministry. They hear a message like this morning in, in the beautiful teenagers, six of them. That, I've never heard of six in one class getting changed. And conviction came and tears came. And the Holy Spirit spoke. They don't know it. They changed into an image of Christ, into something like him. Then when loved ones spoke to him, they changed again. If they're here tonight because they got right this morning, they'll change again. How do you think I feel when I secretly am told that somebody that was here last year is into homosexuality, has had six women, is in three kinds of drugs. And they were over here last year graduating. But listen, before the graduation, folks, they had already changed. This came from their best friend. They got right. One of their best friends got right and told me all about it. Six women lost the virginity had been on pot, heroin, alcohol, I'm sorry, two kinds of drugs, not three. And they're beginning to think, they haven't entered into it at their thinking in terms of experiencing the gay life. How do you think, don't you think I'm going to preach hard when I hear that? We sent them out of Christian schools in that condition. Well, change. The best thing in the world for them last year would have been sent home and, and not had to not allow them to graduate. Here's a mother. Here's a wife. Here's a husband. Here's a businessman. Here's a businesswoman that is determined to be changed. And with an unveiled face without the flesh, they look into the mirror of categories and and behold and gaze at the glory and nature and characteristics of God. And I changed into the, his same image, even by the Holy Spirit. How many understand that? Now they've got mercy. Now they've got grace. Now they have a faith that pleases God and a love that serves God. Mercy is the conditions of salvation. Grace is what God gives to them freely in the abundance of righteousness. Now they have a faith that pleases God and acts for God. The verbs in Hebrews 11. Now they have faith that knows God's mind and believes God and acts in Christ and acts for God. And with that, they're motivated into change by the love of God. And Jesus Christ is resting in his love in Zephaniah 3.17. He's resting in his love. And the word of God says there's only two things you can rest in. The love of God in Zephaniah 3.17 and the faith rest of the word of God in Hebrews 4.9. So they're being changed. The person that has a problem with a male spirit in a female soul, there's not a thing wrong with her just being transformed inside or changed. The person has a drug problem. All he needs is change, 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 change. This is what a Christian does that knows God every day. Changes. Change. Doesn't even know it. Conformed into Christ's image. The husband does it. The wife does it. The, the marriage does it. The emotions. The mind. The heart the soul, friendships, who you're around, keeps changing. Way over here. Boy, this goes a long ways. <laughs> Change. Here we are. You see, Job 14.7 and Job 14.14. 14. Job 14.7 says, if a tree dies, I know 
it'll sprout again. And it will yield some fruit if the tree dies. Then Job said in 14, 14, I know that I will be changed in the future. He was speaking of resurrection, but also it's a practical application. I know just like the tree dies and the sprout comes up, I know I'll be changed. H-A-L-A-P-H, halaf, Genesis 35, 2. A Hebrew word that says to become new and to show newness and 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 to become new and to show newness. You see, if you haven't been changed since last Sunday, you've changed backwards. You're always being changed. How many understand that? See, See, when I come up here at class, and it's the same with the rest of the teachers, when I come up in class, I'm not interested in just giving you a, a well-prepared, pre excellent, exegetical, isagogics in verse-by-verse, uh, word-for-word um, teaching. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in that because we're in college. But I'm interested in seeing you changed in the class every single day. Now, a husband whose wife doesn't change will, will answer for it at the Beamer seat. Because the husband has made decisions that have made her uninterested in changing. The Laodicean church is simply a church where they never ended into a series of changes toward Christ. People think when they get older, and they've been faithful all these years, you can serve in the ministry, work in the ministry, believe in the ministry, honor the ministry, and never, ever continue to be changed. That's why the freshness of mercy and the freshness of grace and the freshness of faith and the freshness of the Holy Spirit motivating us, shed abroad in our hearts, strengthening us, that's why that faith and love following the mercy and grace changes us. Our prayer life changes. Our conversation changes. Our mental attitude changes. Our emotional reproduction changes for God. Our zeal with the word of life changes. Our word of faith toward healing changes soul and body and others being healed. Uh, you don't go back into your emotional syndrome of subject, subjectivity. When you go back here and keep going back, that means you start changing. You start changing. Institutions change. Marriages change. The country changed. The social life changed. People's sexual standards change. And God says... I want you to be transformed and renewed in your heart and renewed in your mind, and I want you to be changed and changed and changed and changed and changed and changed until people make a mistake and think you're just like God. That's the whole thing. That's the truth. Would you bow your heads? Okay, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here this evening and you have not received Jesus Christ and you would like to, say, I believe that you died, that you shed your blood, that you buried and rose again. I want you to be my Lord and Savior, most of all my Savior right tonight. Nobody's looking. Every head is bowed. Put your hand way up high. Put it up high. Father, forgive me. Save me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart to live. Put it up high. Way up high, way up high, way up high. Keep it up, way up high. Come on, shoot it up there. That one scared somebody. They shot it up. 
Come on, put it up and keep it up. I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven. I want to know I'm forgiven, cleansed. I don't want to be this old self-righteous, evangelical, greater grace, stick in the mud, this stuck on my way of life because of my little old negative attitude, my secret pride. It's not very secret to some of us. I want to get right with God, and I want to, in humility and meekness, I want to be changed. That's what you should say to God. Put your hand up high. Put it up high. All right, now. You can look up here. Would you stand? <coughs> Would you raise your hands and thank the Lord tonight? Thank you, Jesus. Praise you and thank you. We love you, we praise you, we thank you today. Thank you, Father. We love you and praise you and thank you. Now tonight, bless the radio offering. What is it, Ron? Radio offering is 20,000. It needs a miracle shot tonight, a shot of divine uh, penicillin or something. Father, bless it tonight radio offering and bless the word of God tonight that may become the word of faith, motivating mercy and motivating grace to be flowing and given to others. We love it that the thing that is Christian therapy is always every day being changed. Protect us from accidents and diseases and bless our businessmen, every one of them, our sales field folks, those working in other places and our parents at home. And we thank you and bless the young and the old and bless in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. You're dismissed. Okay. Okay, this is... Uh good to, to uh, meditate on and relate to. And I think what I'll do is for 10 minutes or so just talk about the message and go over it. And, there'll be, and then you can take a break. And then Pastor Steve will lead you in a review for the final, which is next week. So uh, how many of you have enjoyed this class? Not this particular night, but the whole semester. Yeah, you have? Have you? Do you know that makes me feel good? Huh? It is. Really? Have you? Really? That's amazing. Thank you, Lord. Um, so, uh, I think there were some things. Uh, that let's... Let's understand the essential thing of the message that pastor is basically saying that we have the resources from God because of our new birth to be changed from glory to glory. Where is that written in the Bible? Let's turn there, 2 Corinthians 3, because that's a fundamental part of the message. So 2 Corinthians 3. And, of course, we heard him speak about experience, too, as a pastor, uh, seeing people being changed, and then also uh, what he was saying about, um, about if I'm not changing with God, what a big subject, changing with God. Look at verse 3, verse 18. Could we all read it out loud together? We'll read it slow. Ready? One, two, three. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Okay, now wait a minute. What does it mean, open face? Open face. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, it's a good, you know, it's, like like if you play if you have a halloween mask on you don't have an open face if you have a mask on if you pretend 
if you and I uh, were good at it. We can pretend. We can put a Christian face on. But if you're able to rip it off before God and look at him, then your, your face, you are changed. Because when you behold God and you're looking at God with an open face, verse um, 18, I, did they change my volume on my microphone? Did you do that, Jeremy? You, can you hear me okay? Okay. I've had people... You know, because I, I can hear my voice, and maybe if I wanted to be strong. But then I had this guy in Baku. Not now. I was just came back from Baku. But this guy who was doing the, the volume, you know, and this is 30 years ago. I told him, I said, you do that one more time, I'm going to break your fingers. And so I just met him, and I said, I want to see your fingers. He goes like this. <laughs> It was a joke. Okay. All right, wait. All right, let's go. Verse 18. Beholding as in a, what's a glass? It's a mirror. Yeah. A mirror. So you are looking and what is in a glass, the glory of the Lord. Now, here's a good question. Have you seen the glory of God? I mean, do you, do you know what that is? Have you seen it? Okay. Like I feel when you are filled with the Spirit, that's the, you, are, you are seeing God. You are seeing God, His person. Because the Holy Spirit reveals to you the person of God. So you see the glory of God by being Spirit-filled. Uh, sometimes it's very strong. I'm just curious, out of this class, has anybody had a very strong spiritual experience with God? Okay, that, that's how I'm happy to see. Yes, I believe that. I believe it is normal. I believe it happens to us. It isn't like every day because we're called to live by faith. But it does happen. When you walk with God, it does happen. If it hasn't happened to you, it will. God will, God will do that for you somehow. But you can't put God in a box. You can't punch the buttons and make it happen. It's something of the heart, something by faith, okay? So verse 18, As we with an open face beholding as in a glass of glory of the Lord are changed into the same image, we are changed to be like Christ. Now, you do become that which you love. You do become that which you look at. You do become that which you are relating to. Can I tell you a funny little story? You know, have you ever seen a picture with, of Winston Churchill? And he had a bulldog. And you look at the dog and then you look at him. Have you ever seen a fine Parisian woman with a poodle? A French poodle, okay stereotypes, right? You, I think there is something actually real about what I look at and how it changes me in my heart. But this is not law. This can't be done by our flesh. This is by a walk of faith in the Spirit. That has to be understood in that message we just heard. And the pastor is uh, making a point about walking with God, continuing with God. We need to hear that kind of exhortation and encouragement. But, but it's not purely intellectual. It's spiritual. It's not really a, a function of my own ambition. It's something that happens from when looking at the right thing, looking at God by faith. And this happens in our hearts and we enjoy God. When you start to enjoy God, then you kind of leave the bad changes and you find yourself actually changing and you're enjoying God. And it may be very small increments, something you might not even notice, but you are being changed from glory to glory. I mean, I would say uh, 
It's not identifiable. I cannot measure it. The, the, the beautiful thing about the message is that it's needed to be said. The other side of it is don't be introspective. And just say, you know, I don't think this is working for me. Or I don't know, I'm not that spiritual. Or I don't really know if... Uh, so that, that's not the point of the message. But he's simply saying, uh, if we could, and he mentioned rap sessions, he, he mentioned uh, uh, being a good listener, he, availability to God, and not changing the old pathways. So let's look at that for a moment. I'll take some questions in a minute, but um, we don't have the iPad, right? Or anything. Okay, turn to Proverbs 22. <clears throat> This is a verse I want you to <clears throat> memorize, verse 28. But I think I'm going too fast, to be honest. I think you might have something to say, so I'll stop right there. Let me repeat it. When we change with Jesus, walking with Jesus, our life, we grow, and there are good things that happen in our hearts. We are, but if we stop doing that, we stop doing that, we enter into a slide. And we kind of wake up one day and just realize, you know, I don't have any desire anymore. You know, I pick up some bad habit. I am maybe lazy or careless or indifferent. And that kind of thing can happen. And it happens, you know, and then in my thinking and my my way, my way. So when you go to Bible college, you have a full-time job. You have a lot of responsibilities. You have things that are you, you are doing. And I don't want this to be something that you put yourself under pressure. I want you to enjoy the idea that when I walk in faith, that the Lord will take care of changing me. The Lord will help me. The Lord will fill me every day. I learn how to be thankful when I, I'm driving the truck for biscuit or what is it? Biscuit. Which one? Yeah. And 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 I mean I I I just say that you you can have a lot of God and it will be measured to us according to what we measure. Uh, so that's in Mark chapter four, and. Um, and like learn, learning and faith how to walk with him. And if I don't, then I will, the change that will happen in my life is like a change that happens through my flesh. And that's what, what he said. Okay, any question or comment? You want to talk to your neighbor for a minute? Peter, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I see couples that have been married for 50 years and they really start to tend to look <laughs> really okay well my wife and I are 47 we, we are you know what my wife and I like 47 years and I mean we we are just you know like you know, just, it is something like that. I don't know. And in the body of Christ, too, like, we end up with our language, our heart attitude, and our encouragement, and our faith, and our sense of love, and we, we get encouraged with each other. And Pastor Steve and I, when we were watching the video, the, the good part, we were watching the guys on the stage. Did you see all the pastors in on the stage and identified them yeah I, w I was in there and Ami and Ross was in there Jeff Wissett was in there Pastor Palmer I mean we could name them all because they are very close some have died some have gone away uh, but you know it was a great time and he, he talked about people being changed by listening in a rap young people getting on fire for God, and this kind of thing really happened. And, um, and uh, we, we, it is happening now. I just came from 
uh, in the Middle East from Baku, Azerbaijan, and people from Central Asia, India came, Finland, Budapest, and we just had, we were in a room and, and we just have the same heart and same spirit because we are being changed into his, his glory. And but, but, you know, it's kind of, we don't stand around and just say, you know, look, you know, I have changed, you know. We, it, it's not like that. It's something much more importantly, like in our heart, that even I can't say that I've changed. I can't say really what it, yeah, you know, we don't have an interest in like defining it like, in the context of ourselves, we would like to say rather, the Lord Jesus is satisfying me. He's helping me in my life. He's, uh, he's enough for me. He's more than enough. He's our life. And, and that, that if I could just have that happening in my life all the time, it'll keep me out of a lot of trouble. You know? Okay? Yes, sir. Uh, or pastors die uh, and resurrect them. Um, pastors and, die and what? And resurrect. Resurrect. And resurrect? Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, they do expect or feel that they want to die physically. Um, is that to say that? Um, the the and every pastor will go through uh, trouble one way or the other. Uh, what 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 does he? What is the point he's trying to make over there? Because I get the impression that uh, every pastor will go through some form of trouble that he or she feels like dying, but mm -hmm. not the physical death, but spiritual death. Yes. Okay, uh, my, my short answer uh, that comes to my mind when I was listening to that is 2 Corinthians 4. And uh, uh, it says there, verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death. It doesn't say for us pastors, but it's really for all of us. We are delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. And what does he mean? It's like we get in trouble and I have one way out, and that's the death of the cross, where I surrender my rights to myself, to God, and I say, I trust you, God. I die, my ego, my self-interest, my advantages. If you think of how Jesus died, he was, he was shamed, he was uh, hurt, he was lied about, he was misunderstood. And that was the death of the cross. And he was also alone. So in the beginning, when Pastor said that he feels like he is and uh, the pastor said uh, to him, are you in a trial? And he said, yes. And this is like a death. It's like a death to myself. But, but the resurrection comes, a spiritual resurrection in this lifetime, when you go through death and you're trusting God, just like with Jesus, three days later, he was resurrected. For us, it would mean... I've lost my self-interest, my self-advantage, my honor, my reputation, and I've surrendered to God. And then he has filled me with the Spirit, and I have life. I have love. I have joy. I have peace. I have spiritual power. And you get the spiritual power through the deaths of the cross. And I feel that that's why Pastor was effective in his ministry because the cross that you and I, we, we end up living when we follow God, uh, we take up the cross, we, we understand that this isn't about us, but we, 
we surrender to him. And then the anointing of God, the spirit of God is on your life. You have the authority of God, the blessing of God in your life. And this is for the men and the women, the pastors and the servants, the nursery workers, the counselors, the teenage, you know, everybody, a teenager can take up the cross and find the spiritual life of Christ in their life. Okay, so uh, when that is happening in our life, it really motivates us. We have it with each other. And then it keeps us from changing in a bad way that he talked about and um, encouraged us not to uh, have that happen. So that, that verse, I want to end here, but Proverbs 20. 228. Have you, did you see it? Okay, uh, I'll just read it to you. Uh, remove not the ancient landmark. Now, in the Jewish culture, when they had their territories, they, had, they didn't have surveyors and mathematical calculations and that kind of thing that today we have legal territories marked out but they would have landmarks, uh, maybe a rock or a river or a, a hill or something, and they would have their land marked out by landmarks. Yeah, yeah, and uh, maybe driving a stake in the ground or whatever, I don't know. But the ancient landmark was not to be removed. It, the territory had to stay generation after generation the same territory. If that's a metaphor for our doctrine and our faith, then, then it applies. Don't change your teaching on the Trinity. Don't change your teaching on the Bible being the Word of God. Don't change your teaching on victory or the finished work. Don't, don't change the ancient landmarks. And we could say regarding Greater Grace World Outreach, we have a Bible college and we don't want that to be changed. We want to train people to be in Bible call. Evangelism, we want to share our faith. We don't want that to be changed. Now, here, here's the last point. Liberal theologians often have come from conservative schools. They've gotten saved on the street or saved by an evangelist. They've come to Jesus, and then they learn, and they're educated and in the school they go to, they end up becoming liberal-minded. And the school is saying the Bible is very true, but not every part. Let me show you where there are contradictions or discrepancies. So they go to that kind of school, and they, they, they become uh, like neo-Orthodox, Karl Barth-type um, theologians. And they lose their... They lose what, what I feel that I, we have embraced, that we want to be very sacredly look at the Bible this way. But I'm, I'm bright, I'm intelligent, I am not, but a man could say, I can feel this part is from God, this part is not, this is, doesn't relate, and they take the Bible like that. But we go like this, the Bible is above me. I'm trusting God, and God, this is your word in every part of it. And I, I am trusting you, and, and change me from glory to glory. But I'm afraid that there are intellectuals, and maybe some of you might fall into that category, where you will be changing and removing the ancient landmark and changing your theology. So be very aware of that. And follow those kind of people that all their life, or Billy Graham, you know, those kind of men of God and women of God, that all their life they embrace it. Read Billy Graham's uh, biography, because this happened to him. Two men, Billy Graham and his dear friend, both of them, one became liberal, and Billy Graham had to, had to decide, am I going that way, or I'm going to stay this way? as a fundamentalist, and he did. He stayed that way, and God used him. This was 1946, maybe, just before the Los Angeles um, campaign. He uh, had a crisis in his faith. 
Am I really believing that this is God's word or, or part of it is? So, so that was an example. Okay, uh, I'm going to hang out for a few minutes. You can take a break and then come on back and Pastor Steve will help guide you. And come, If you want to ask me something, come on up and talk to me.